Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about some interesting issues that are coming up in the courts with regards to masking and how the courts are dealing with that. So let's go to a transcript here and the witness who's up on the stand we can see is asset protection. So they're a loss prevention officer. Their job is to monitor for people who might be trying to take things and try to prevent that from happening. So if we scroll down a little bit, we can see here the crux of their testimony is, so I was working on that day when I saw the accused. She had some merchandise in her cart. And then I was watching her in the camera. I saw her selecting some stuff, meat and grocery items and other items randomly. And then I saw her going to towards exit door through Joe Apparel section. So Joe Apparel section, it's a clothing section, which is right in front of, well, kind of exit doors. So as she left the store, she passed through the first exit door. I, I stopped her and I told her, introduced myself and told her that you were under arrest for shoplifting. Okay, where were you within the store when you saw the accused? I was in my loss prevention room around the camera. So this is a fairly common sort of shoplifting allegation. In particular, people taking meat is quite common in these things because it's, it's fairly easy for people to resell that. And so these are high dollar amount uh, items that can be resold for a, for a profit. Now the main issue that comes up here is identification. And so we see here, I say, okay, and do you see her here today? Yes. And then where? Here in front of me and beside that lady over there, right there. Now the Crown asks, at this time, Your Honor, I ask that she just remove her mask. And we skip ahead. So this is the first, the last page was page five. This is page 28. This is the transcript as it was provided to me. But it comes back to this issue. And the Crown, uh, Mr. Wixon indicates just one matter, Your Honor, just for the purpose of identification, the doc ID was admitted, but for just to clarify for the accused, if we could ask that the accused, or for the witness, just ask that the accused removed her mask for the purpose of identification. And Ms. Hatch, who's defense counsel here, is opposed to that. She says, respectfully, I would submit that no person should have to take off their mask if they don't wish to. That's, that's my position. And she indicates, because we all know what we're dealing with, and basically because of the whole pandemic issue. And the Crown says, well, the issue or the risk is not that serious. It's likely minimal in this case. And for the purposes of a trial, it's identification is a very serious matter. It's one of the matters. I would suggest that if it pleases the court, if the accused wants to take a step, a few steps backwards away from anybody and remove her mask, if that would make her feel more comfortable. So to provide a little bit of context here, one of the things that you have to prove in any criminal case, assuming you can prove that something happened, you have to also prove that the person who's in court is the person who did the crime. So that's what we mean when we say identification. Is this the right person that we've got here in court, or are we potentially going to be sending somebody, the wrong person, to jail? So that has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a tough standard. So the way the Crown is trying to get some evidence or some further evidence here is with what we call a doc identification and what that is and you will have seen this in movies all the time or tv shows it's where you've got the accused person and they're sitting by their lawyer or else in the uh, in the dock so they're there they're the you know they're there because they're the accused and the witness is up on the stand and is asked do you see the person here today and they say, yes, I do. And they point. And so that's, I, you know, they identify the accused. And they pretty much always identify the accused in a doc ID. A doc ID is not a great means of conducting an identification. And the reason why is that eyewitnesses are actually pretty bad. Eyewitnesses will often get it wrong. And you don't want to have an identification set up that shows or that suggests to the witness the right answer. But of course, how can it be any other way when you're talking about a doc identification? Because there's only one person there, usually, who isn't either the defense lawyer, uh, the clerk, the judge, uh, possibly a sheriff. 
the witness isn't going to point any of these people out as, you know, as the person who committed the offense. And although we have open courts, for most trials, and especially for something where we're, the allegation is a shoplifting, usually there aren't a whole lot of people watching. In fact, quite often, most of the trials I've conducted have been with an empty room behind me. Nobody else is there. So out of a choice of one person, they're going to point to that person. We've all seen uh, sort of this kind of lineup here. And this is another bad form of lineup. There's a whole lot of reasons why this lineup, if you remember, is a bad lineup. The first reason is that literally everyone up there is somebody they suspect of being involved in a crime in some fashion. So you don't want to do that. You want to have just one target because literally a witness couldn't miss anybody there. Everybody's a suspect. So a proper lineup will include one or maybe a few targets, but also a lot of sort of distractors, wrong answers. And those distractors should be similar to the, uh, to the person, such that if you had a description and only a description, you wouldn't necessarily know which one, you know, which person you were talking about. So if the accused is, has been described as black or white, you want the, you know, the other people in the lineup, the wrong answers, to be the same race. And if the accused is described as being tall, you know, six feet, you don't want to have one six foot accused and a whole lot of, you know, five foot people because they're not going to, it's not a fair lineup at that point. It just tells you who the police think actually did it. So the other thing is ideally in a lineup, you don't want everybody presented up at once because if everyone's up at once, what witnesses tend to do is they pick the best fit. They pick the one that is closest. So an ideal lineup, if you really want to show that you've done an identification with a witness and that this is likely a correct identification, best practice is they will give the witness a book of photos or a stack of photos and the witness goes through them one by one and they don't necessarily know how many photos there are. So they look at the first picture and they say yes or no. And if they say yes, then they say why? You know, why do you think it's this person? And once they've made that determination, they turn it over and they don't get to go back to that picture. So they can't later go back and say, you know, I think it was number two. They have to decide and then move on. So then after they've made that determination, they flip to the next one. And each of these pictures should be somebody who could potentially sort of fit the description. There's a bit of a paradox here. You want those distractor or you know, non-target people to be close to the person that is the suspect. But of course, you don't want them to be an exact match. If, you, if we imagine the sort of weird hypothetical of one person and their eight identical twins, obviously a witness isn't going to be able to manage that. But you want them similar enough that they could potentially be picked by somebody who maybe heard a description and didn't actually see anybody. Or, you know, they have to be a viable sort of bad choice. And if they're doing with that photo method, once they get to the end of that, they're done. They don't get to go back and sort of make a determination. And if they haven't picked anybody, then they just didn't recognize the person. But lineups are done poorly in various ways. And one of the worst examples is the dock identification because it's really just a lineup of one person in a situation that very much suggests this is the person you should pick because clearly they're the accused. So that's what they're trying to do here. That's the evidence that they're trying to rely on. So let's go and... Uh, Skip back and have a look at how the court deals with this. So the court indicates, well, these are highly exceptional times. Certainly, I don't think for something that is a fairly simple charge. And what the court is indicating here is that we're talking about a shoplifting. And so if we think about the potential risks here, and if somebody got really sick or even, you know, suffered some more substantial consequence, 
it's a little disproportionate to a shoplifting charge. So the court is going to be a little reluctant to require somebody to take off a mask in that circumstance where it's a minor charge. If it was a more serious charge, if we were talking about a sexual assault or a murder or something, you know, an armed robbery, an aggravated assault, any of these sorts of more serious charges, the court might have viewed this a little more differently. They might have said, well, because these charges are more serious, we're going to ask for it. And defense here argues as well, but it occurred to me that the weight of a doc identification, the law says, Hibbert, that or the Supreme Court rather, says that a doc identification is virtually meaningless. And what that means is that the Supreme Court, amongst other courts, have identified the problems with these doc IDs, the ones I just told you about. And they've said essentially that a doc ID should have so little weight put on it. There are cases where in the courts have refused to allow a doc ID to happen in front of a jury because they're concerned that a jury would be tainted by this because it's of so little actual value. But you have to admit, it's great showmanship. You've got the jury there and you can get the witness to dramatically point and say, that's the person, that's who whatever the crime is, or whatever the alleged crime is. So it can taint the jury pool just because it's so dramatic and potentially compelling in appearance while actually being of little real value. So Miss Hatch goes on to say that it's not in the public interest. And the court says, I agree with you. And I think that in the same vein as Nicholson, which is a Alberta Court of Appeal decision, says the same thing about Doc ID. I agree. So on, and given her indication to you as well, and that's referring back to the fact that she, the witness wasn't feeling well, I'm not going to make her take off her mask in these circumstances. So the court refuses to require that. And later, uh, we see defense counsel here makes a direct reference to the fact that a photographic lineup would have been more helpful, but that the Crown hadn't done that. And the reason for that is just resourcing. It takes a whole bunch of effort to get a witness in, to present them this lineup. So they're less likely to do it on a shoplifting charge, which is lower end. So it wasn't done here. And the defense is quite properly pointing that out and saying this would have been good evidence, but we don't have that. And the Crown comes back to this issue and says, just your honor, that the difficulty with the accused continuing to wear a mask makes it difficult also for yourself, the doc ID being one matter, uh, matter of weight, but also for yourself to identify the person in the images and for making your determination. So essentially saying, Your Honor, if this person took off the mask, you could also look at the security camera footage and be able to tell. And the court doesn't really like this argument here. The court gets a little... Uh, this is very gentle sharpness from the court. So the court is kind of rebuking the crown here, but not harshly. And just says, all right, well, I just want to state again, I had already made my ruling with regards to whether or not the young lady had to take her mask off. So that this is a very gentle rebuke saying, essentially, this decision is done. I already made it. I'm not going to revisit it. So, and that's very common. A judge doesn't want, once they've decided something, they don't want the people to trying to get another kick at the can or a second bite at the apple, as is often the turn of phrase used by defense counsel. And really what was determinative was the case law. Specifically, it is trite law at this point. What trite law means is law that is so well established that it's essentially obvious in court. And from a practice perspective, trite law can actually be a bit of a pain because if you're ever in a position where you need to produce a citation for trite law, sometimes if something's old enough, that principle, it can be hard to find where it came from. But in this case, they do have some citations. They say specifically the case of Nicholson from the Court of Appeals specifically states that doc ID is meaningless because it is so highly suggestive to witnesses when they're testifying about identity. And then goes on to say, but at the end of the day, I think really it was the fact that it has been specifically stated that doc ID is essentially meaningless. But this is a case where the central issue is identity. And ultimately, what we see here is the court notes, and the gentleman was never given any sort of a photo lineup. 
and so did not have the benefit of recognition evidence. Crown has advanced that if one looks at the video, there's a point where the accused or who is believed to be the accused face is recognizable on the video. I disagree. I don't believe that that is something that is readily recognizable just if we consider the video alone. So just from the perspective of a lawyer and to sort of provide a bit of background, oftentimes when we're dealing with surveillance camera video, it's often very bad quality. And so bad quality video, low resolution, fuzzy video, is pretty good at telling you what happened. So you can see somebody go up to a display, they reach out, they take something, they put it in their bag. All of that is very easy to see, even if the quality is poor. But it can be very bad at telling you who did it. Because if the quality isn't great, you're not going to get those facial details that are key for recognition. And so a lot of times videos are not great at telling you this is actually the person who did it and letting you identify them. So that may be what's going on here. I haven't seen the video, so I can't say for certain. But the fact that the judge is essentially saying, I don't think that there's ever a point where that was you know, available. That's probably what's going on here. They say, so, and so again, the witness attempted, I think, to give the best description that he could in the circumstances. But I certainly think that, as I said, this is a situation where he made an honest mistake. And certainly I think that his prior dealings with the person who he was uh, dealing with on that day, who he believed to be the accused, whom he dealt with on previous occasions, is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt of her identity. And so ultimately the court acquits. This, to my mind, is interesting and it's going to be a bigger issue. When can the court demand that a witness take off a mask for identification? case that I think might provide a little bit of guidance is actually in a bit of a different context. This is the case of NS and Her Majesty the Queen. And what this case was about was a Muslim woman who was required to testify at a sexual assault trial and she habitually wears the niqab. And so she was arguing that being required to take that off to testify would affect her religious freedom. And the court actually had to decide this issue and to decide whether she could be directed to remove it. And the preliminary inquiry judge had concluded that her belief was not that strong and ordered her to remove it. The court of appeal had said that's not, uh, not proper and said that the uh, witness's freedom of religion and the accused fair trial interests were both engaged and could not be reconciled. The witness may be ordered to remove the niqab depending on context. So that's not terribly clear, but the Court of Appeal returned the matter to the preliminary inquiry judge. She appealed. And so here we see the court having a bit of a difficult time with this. And what the court actually comes to is that where a witness has and what they describe as sincere religious release, uh, reasons, but I'm not sure that religious reasons are necessarily going to be the only possible way to get to somebody wearing masks, particularly if somebody is able to argue, for instance, some danger to their life or to their health. And they say they will be required to remove it if A, this is necessary to prevent a serious risk to the fairness of the trial because reasonably available alternative measures will not prevent the risk. And B, the salutary, or salutary rather, uh, effects of requiring her to remove the niqab outweigh the deleterious effects. So the good has to outweigh the bad. They note that applying this framework involves answering four questions. First, would requiring the witness to remove the niqab while testifying interfere with religious freedom? So they have to, or she had to show that it will, that it's based on a sincere religious belief, not just one that's, you know, made up or convenient. There may be some arguments about you know, in future with witnesses, whether they're actually, this is something that they've practiced for years or something that's just come up. Here, if we sort of look at the analogy with regards to the, uh, you know, the COVID masking, there may be whether or not this is a serious risk to the person's health, whether they suffer from some conditions that might aggravate that, you know, somebody who's got COPD or something where they're at a higher risk, That'll be something for the courts to sort out. 
And it's unclear whether this framework would be the one adopted, but it's one that I think could be adopted by courts. And the next is, would there be a serious risk to trial fairness? And so the main issue where trial fairness comes up is usually when you've got a witness who's up there testifying, and if you can't see their face, how do you know their credibility? You know, if the little tells that might indicate to you that somebody's lying. So that's sort of the issue there. And they say there's a deeply rooted presumption in our legal system that seeing a witness's face is important to a fair trial by enabling effective cross-examination and credibility assessment. So that's what I was just saying. You know, how do we know if this person is lying or telling the truth if we can't see their face, if they're obscured? They're saying, however, whether being unable to see the witness's face threatens trial fairness in any particular case will depend on the evidence that the witness is to provide. So sometimes a witness might be testifying about something that's not going to be a big deal. Uh, for instance, you might have a police officer who says simply, I attended at a scene of a crime. I picked up, you know, a gun or whatever. Here's where it was found. I took it into evidence. I moved it to the evidence locker. This is the same one that I checked in, that sort of thing. This kind of evidence is going to be fairly uncontroversial in most circumstances. And generally, you're not going to be arguing a credibility-based attack. You're not going to be arguing typically in that kind of scenario that the officer has in some fashion lied or misled. So in those cases, not being able to see their face has a less strong impact on trial fairness. But in some cases, you might have a strong, you know, he said, she said kind of argument. And in that case, it'll be a higher issue. They also note, if both freedom of religion and trial fairness are engaged on the facts, a third question must be answered. Is there a way to accommodate both rights and avoid the conflict between them? So if we think about the mask issue, uh, for instance, having somebody testify remotely might do it. You know, so they're not in a courtroom, which might have a lot of people. The Crown's suggestion in this case that the witness step back away from people and engage in some physical distancing might actually be a good argument. So that might might be one that future courts view as a stronger position. And so essentially they're saying, can we do both? Because there's going to be times where that is possible and there's going to be times where it isn't. And lastly, the last aspect is simply a weighing. Is the harm to somebody's rights here going to exceed the harm to the trial fairness? And that is going to be a little bit of a fuzzier question. The court's going to have to essentially make a judgment call. But the Supreme Court does give a bit of guidance here in terms of, you know, the credibility aspects, the fair trial aspects. But it's very much a weighing sort of question. So that's how the Supreme Court has handled it in a very different context. But the courts are going to be called upon to ask, answer these questions more and more going forward, at least until the situation resolves. We've seen a sort of initial case here, and I think it's a bit of an enlightening and interesting one. But ultimately, we don't yet know how this is going to shake out once, once the courts have had chance to get some binding precedent from higher levels of court. I hope that this has been useful. Thank you for watching. If you have any comments, please leave them below. And if you have any questions that you might want to see me address in a future video, that's a great place as well. If you found this useful or interesting, please like, share, and subscribe. I've also left a link to my Patreon if you want to provide more direct support. I also want to give a thank you to my first patron, whose username is MaBuddyKeith. Thank you, and I look forward to future videos.